In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Good morning, everyone. And good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Amen, amen. Hopefully everybody is doing well. I know it's been a long service and liturgy has been a little bit longer than usual. Um, but that's because, if you guys know, we are in the middle of Lent. Um, it's one of the biggest fasts within our church. So liturgy tends to run a little bit longer during that time just because of we have the spiritual hymn, the explanation that goes with it. Um, and it's a time for us to be in the church too. So uh, that's why it's been a little bit longer. But I hope and pray that this fast has been fruitful to all of us. Um, and last week, for those of you guys that were here, we said that this fast, we're going to expect to be different. We're not just going to fast just because our friends are fasting, our parents are fasting, or people around us are fasting, or the church tells us to fast. But we're going to change something about us at the end of this fast. And that should be our goal. And we should truly, through the grace and mercy of God, wrestle with God as the prophet Job did, that we should see a change, that if we fast, if we pray, that we should be different. We might not be the, you know, we might not be who we want to be, but we're not where we used to be. So I hope and pray that you're pushing towards a little bit of change in your spiritual life, and that's what the goal that Lent is all about. So I hope everybody has been uh, pursuing that. Um, so we are in week two of five. Uh, we started a series titled Pursuit of Holiness. Um, last week was the introduction, and this series is based on a book called The Divine Ascent. It's about climbing a ladder. And so if you think about climbing the ladder, this book talks about 30 different virtues or 30 different steps that we must take to get closer to God. And that's why we fast. That's why we come to church. That's why we do the things that we do, all about our relationship with God. I'm not where I am today, but can I take a step forward, right? And next fast, can I take another step forward? And that's what life and that's what this journey is all about. It's about climbing a ladder. Now, I said last week that this book is written to monks, right? It's written to monks. But before we just say, well, that's not a book for me or I'm not a monk, be careful. Be careful. Why? Because monks, they're Christians, right? The principles. The principles. Like this. Can you guys hear me? Okay. All right. The principles that this book talks about, it still applies to our life. The difference is the application. How monks apply it to their life is completely different of the way how we apply it. So this book is an amazing book. If you haven't gotten it, I encourage you to get it. Why? We're only going to talk about five of the 30 virtues, five of the 30 steps. Talking about just five out of the 30. So, again, it's a great book. It's an easy read, but the application is going to be a little bit different in how we apply it to our life. All right, with that being said, who remembers our main verse, our theme verse for this series? The book of what? Ephesians chapter 413. Everybody say that with me. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13. So St. Paul tells us, until we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to, a, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. We have two goals. The first one is highlighted in blue. They're both highlighted in blue. Is the knowledge of the Son of God. Knowledge of the Son of God. Everybody say that with me. Knowledge of the Son of God. And we said last week, knowledge is not here. A lot of times we think about God, it's about knowing God, who he is, memorizing verses, memorizing prayers, memorizing different things within our church. That's good knowledge and we should do that. But what St. Paul here is talking about, it's not knowledge of I know God, but I have a relationship with him. It's about an intimate relationship. I could sit here and tell you guys, I watch a lot of basketball. Steph Curry is my favorite player. I could tell you everything about him. Me and him share the same birthday. I can say a lot about him. But do I know him? No. Who kn like, not the way that his wife might know him. Because she has a personal relationship with him. So same thing with here. What St. Paul is saying is not knowledge here. 
But do we have a relationship with God? Do we know him or do we know about him? So that's our goal and that's what we're going to focus on today. Today and next week is that the first goal is about knowledge and what that means. And the last two weeks of the series, we're going to look at the second goal, which is the measure of the stature of the fullness of God. And what that means is we were created in God's image. And what St. Paul is saying is all of our life is to go back to that image. It's to be in the image of Christ. When Christ was obedient, we're obedient. We get his characteristics. We do what Jesus did. We forgive. We give. We fast. And that's what we're going to focus on on the last two weeks of the series. But today, we're going to focus on knowledge of God, today and next week. So, with that being said, last week was all about detachment. Last week was about, about detachment. So if you missed last week, I encourage you guys to go visit our YouTube page and get caught up. Because if we don't do the first step, if we don't detach from whatever is holding us back, it'll be hard to climb. It's going to be hard to get up the ladder with a lot of things that we're holding. Last week, we looked at the example of Abraham. God comes to him and says, I'm going to use you to bring healing into the world to bring healing into your family. But you have to detach. You got to leave this area. What you're comfortable with. It seemed like Abraham was giving up a lot. He gave up his family. Gave up his land. Gave up everything he was comfortable with. And as a result of that, he gained God. And that's the cost that he had to pay. A lot of us, we want the promise We want the end goal, but who's willing to pay the cost of detachment? If you want to follow God, if you want to pursue God, we can't pursue God while living a different life. So that's what we looked at last week. And again, I hope and pray that everybody gets to caught up because that's very important. That's going to set up for the rest of this week or this series. So what we're going to look at today is one of the steps, and the book calls it Seeking Union with God Through Prayer. Seeking Union with, to, with God Through Prayer. When we think of uh, prayer, there's different types of prayer that we do within the church. There is a personal prayer that we do at home. There is intercessory prayer that we can do when we pray for one another. There is a litany prayer that happens here every Sunday. 5 a.m. with like five people here. There's sa'atat that our church does. So there are different types of prayer. But what we're going to talk about is the pinnacle of all prayers. The prayer of all prayers today. Which is liturgical prayer. What we do here on Sundays. A lot of times we may not even think of that as a prayer. But that's what we do. It's a prayer that we do every Sunday, and that's what we're going to focus on today. Before I start, I have a story. So my wife and I, we got married 2017, six, seven years, six years ago. Um, We got married at the church, and we were inviting people to our wedding, to the church. And I had a few coworkers that I was close with that I wanted to invite to the church, and we're like, So we invite them, yes, no, you know, they're not orthodox, they might not understand, and we kind of went back and forth, but if they're going to see me get married, I wanted them to come to church. So some of my coworkers came to church, they came to liturgy, and the first thing, you know, I give them the fly, the invitation, um, and they're excited to come to the church. They looked at the invitation, and they said, they saw 5 a.m., they said, oh, that's a mistake. It's got to be p.m. They're like, dude, you made a mistake. So I explained to them and all that stuff, and then, okay, they're like, okay. So they came to the church, and after, um, after, um, after the ceremony ended and at the, at the end of the church, uh, some of my coworkers come, and they, we, we had a conversation. And one of my coworkers, and specifically him, he had a lot of questions. And he said a lot of things that I'm not going to repeat here, but two things that he said was, why do you need to bother God that early? And the second one is, 
why bother God for that long? So those are the two things that he came out of from the whole ceremony. But if we think about it, now he's African-American, never been to an Orthodox church. Some of us, we've been raised in the church, and we probably have the same question. Why so long? Why so early? I'm tired. Why can't we sit? Why do we have to stand? I'll be honest. When I first started coming around to the church in my late 20s, liturgy was boring. It was something that I was like, what's, I don't understand it. When I started teaching my Sunday school students, class started about 9 o'clock, 8.30 or 9 o'clock. I will come right before I have to teach them. As a Sunday school teacher, liturgy was boring. It was long. I didn't understand it. I didn't see a point. And it's tiring. Fast forward a few years later, liturgy became something that I fell in love with, something that I couldn't get enough of. It wasn't too long anymore. I felt like it was too short. For those of you guys that know, I went to a church that started liturgy at 5.45 a.m. Because we had to leave by 9. Like, the church had to close. We had to wrap. It was a rental similar to this. We had to leave by, like, 10 o'clock. So by 9.30, liturgy's over. We clean and we leave. So getting to church at 5.45 was nothing. What changed? Liturgy was the same. It started at the same time. It was just as long. And now a spot is just longer. But what changed? My perspective changed. My understanding of liturgy changed. And that's what our goal here today is. It's not for us to learn everything about liturgy. But to say, what don't I under, what is it? Like, what must be like, why do people come in every Sunday and stand for this long? So, our goal today is to maybe have a shift change about a little bit of our perspective and our understanding of liturgy. So basic background information. The word liturgy, the word liturgy is a Greek word. It's a Greek word, and it means the work of the people. It means people coming together to do something. So you can say, we're going to liturgy and feed the homeless. That's liturgy. You can say we're going to liturgy and we're going to go clean the park. It's a group of people working for something common. So the, when I say the word liturgy, we're going to talk about the liturgy of the Eucharist or Holy Communion. And that's what we do here on Sundays. So when I use the term liturgy, I'm not talking about liturgy of let's go liturgy and you know, help the homeless or clean the park or anything like that. So I'm talking about the liturgy of the Eucharist, which is what we do here every Sunday. And the whole point of this prayer, the whole idea is a prayer that takes an offering that the church gives, which is the bread and which is the wine, and transforming that into the actual flesh and blood of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. That's liturgy of the Eucharist. So if you hear liturgy of the Eucharist, that's what it is. it's a prayer that the church offers a bread and wine. That's the what? And then transforms into the actual flesh and blood of Christ. That's why we liturgy, and that's what we do here every Sunday. So with that mindset, we'll go through three different lessons. And I'm hoping that our perspective, our understanding will change. Not saying we're going to answer every question. But at least curiosity for us to say, okay, maybe this is something that I should take seriously. Because when I first started my church journey, liturgy was the last thing I wanted to do. Bible study, good, sign me up. Life group, sign me up. Come to liturgy at 545, no thank you. But over time, that perspective changed. And that's what I'm hoping that we can do today. So the first lesson is, Liturgical worship 
is biblical worship. Liturgical worship is biblical worship. Like I said, all of us, we have questions about liturgy or about the church in general. And there's nothing wrong with asking questions. Why is it so early? Why so long? Why do we have to wear these natala or scarves or whatever they're called in English? But why do we have to, you know, whatever it is, whatever questions that we have, it's good to ask these questions. But we should ask the right person. We need to ask the right person. Not just Google, not just somebody that doesn't go to church and gives you whatever answer, thinks sounds good. But we need to ask the right person. The right person, when we think about liturgy, has there been a time where God talks about how he wants to be worshipped? Has there been a time where God says, this is how I want to be worshipped? Because on Sundays... The recipient of that worship is not us, it's God. A lot of times we think we come for us. Liturgy is for me. Liturgy is for us as the giver. He's the recipient of that worship. If you think about it, say I ask you today, buy me a gift. You would ask, who's the gift for is it a boy or is it a girl? Is it a baby or an older like person? Who is the gift for? Because the gift that you're going to help me pick depends on who the recipient is. Same thing with liturgical worship. The recipient of that gift is God himself. If we pay attention to the priest, when he's done doing the liturgy service, He's not looking at us. His back is against us, and he's facing the ark because we're not the recipient. God is. So with that mindset, let's ask God if he cares how he wants to be worshipped. Let's see if there's a time that he talked about, this is how you, I want you to worship me. If we read the Old Testament, all of the Old Testament is about God instructing Moses of how to build a place that he will talk to Moses about the tabernacle, about the Ark of the Covenant. We're going to read a few verses. And again, we can't get through everything today, explain everything today. But pay attention to the detail and how God talks to Moses when he's telling him to build them an Ark, an Ark of the Covenant, where he will be the dwelling place of God and where he will talk to them. So Exodus chapter 25, and we'll start through verse 19. He said, Thus you shall make the ark of testimony from incorruptible wood. Two and a half cubits shall be its length, a cubit and a half its width, and a cubit and a half its height. You shall overlay with pure gold inside and out. You shall overlay it and shall make it on a ranch of gold all around. Do you see the details, God? Two and a half, not three, not two, but 2.5. Let's keep reading. You shall also make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two and a half cubits shall be its length, and a cubit and a half its width. Then you shall make two cherubim of gold of hammered work. You shall make them at the two ends of the mercy seat. Mercy seat. If this was open, you guys probably have seen the icon of the Virgin Mary with her son. And that's what we're talking about, the mercy seat, where we are... The, we are talking about the incarnation, about God becoming man. And that's what he's talking about here on the mercy seat, where Christ became the sacrifice. Let's keep reading. He said, you shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, which is what we have in the back. And in the ark, you shall put the testimonies I will give you. There I will make myself known to you. And I will speak with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are on the ark of testimony. So here's God. Does God care about how we worship him? Does God care about the way that he's worshipped? He's very detailed. So in the Orthodox Church, everything you see, the curtains, the color, the Ark of the Covenant, what the priest does, everything comes as biblical. The more we take time to pay attention, 
and ask the right people the right questions and see God, you will see this is God's instruction of how he wants to be worshipped. There's not a lot of wiggle room in there. I know people are thinking, well, that's the Old Testament. We don't do the Old Testament stuff. Excuse me? Is your God different from the Old Testament than the New Testament? It's the same God. The offering has changed. Instead of offering rams, instead of offering animals, Christ becomes the offering. That's the difference. What changes us? It's not God. When it comes to worship, it's not about what pleases us. It's about what pleases God and how he wants to be worshipped. Being honest here, I know people personally say, you know what, I don't see you at church. People will say, oh, there is a church closer to my house. It starts at 10 a.m. It starts at 11 a.m. And it's only a couple hours, so, like, it fits my schedule. At least I'm going to church. Some people have that mentality. But who are you worshiping at that time? Is it God or your schedule? Is it God or our schedule? When we try to fit God in our schedule, you know what? This, the Orthodox church that starts very early and that's that long doesn't fit my schedule. So let me find something else. That fits my schedule. God cares about how he wants to be worshipped. We are not the recipient of that worship. It's God. So, in the New Testament, is there a time where they talk about liturgy? I always go back to the book of Acts, which is how the early church history started. You have the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then right after that, you have the book of Acts. It's about how the early church history started and what they did. And we'll read a verse here and tell me if you see the word liturgy. <clears throat> As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. You see the word liturgy there? The word ministered. Again, with, due to the translation of the Bible, translation kind of get lost. That's the same word that the Greek uses to talk about liturgy, right? So if you look at the Greek translation for the same verse, it reads as they liturgy to the Lord. And another clue that we see about the word liturgy there is that they fasted. And they're talking about liturgy of the Eucharist. We fast before coming to church, don't we, on Sundays? We don't have a breakfast to have a nice meal and come. We fast. So again, we see the same thing here in the book of Acts where they do the liturgy. So liturgy isn't something that we just said, oh, I think it will be nice to do on Sunday mornings. But it's something that they did in the early church history. So again, liturgy is biblical worship. We are not the recipient. God is the recipient of that worship. Our first lesson. The second one is liturgical worship is heavenly worship. Liturgical worship is heavenly worship. I think Dagon Ashanafi was saying here earlier when he was doing the announcement, he said the saints are rejoicing and celebrating with us during liturgy, during the baptism. The angels are in the presence when we go to church, we're going to a building, we're going to St. Paul Church or whatever church that we may go to, but when we walk through these doors during liturgy, we're entering into heaven. We're entering into heaven. I know what most of you guys are thinking. First, I said it's biblical. Now we're saying it's like heaven. Like, how do we know it's like heaven? Like, did I go to heaven? Like, how do you know? How do we know? We know people that have went to heaven and that have written about it in the Bible. We're going to look at their stories and what they said. But that mindset, when we are in liturgy, we are worshiping God with the angels in our presence. 
So the first one we're going to look at is from the book of Revelation. Chapter 8, verse 3. He said, Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. Revelation is a book in the New Testament. It's about a prophecy. The only book in the New Testament that talks about a prophecy. So here, Saint, he's talking about incense, about a golden censer. And we see the priest going around with an incense. We have incense in our church. Why? That's how they worship God in heaven. David, he said, accept my prayers as an incense before you. Incense is talked about a lot in the Bible. When Jesus was born, he got three gifts, one of them being incense. Some people got something against incense. Like we take incense, we take like one-third of his birthday gift. God likes incense. So in our liturgical service, we use incense. So that was the book of Revelation. When we look at what the prophet Isaiah said in the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 6, 1 through 7, and we've kind of broken this into a few, few verses. And this is what the prophet Isaiah talks about. He said, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up. The house was full of his glory. Around him stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. And one cried out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, who the whole earth is full of his glory. That word highlighted. Where do we see that? That's what we say in our, ver in our liturgy. If we go to the next slide, this is what we say. Sometimes we chant things, and we might not know where it comes from. But this is what the angels are praising God. This is how they worship. So in return, the way we worship God, we echo the same words that they're echoing. It keeps going. Same uh, uh, verse. The lintel was lifted up by the voice of those who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. Don't we have smoke here around the house with the incense? So again, what they do in heaven is a replica of, what, of our liturgical worship. So I said, woe is me because I am pierced to the heart. For being a man and having unclean lips, I dwelt in the midst of people with unclean lips. So again, we see the smoke. We see incense. And this is what the prophet Isaiah is saying. And we keep going. For I saw the king, the Lord of hosts, with my eyes. Then one of the seraphim was sent to me. He had a live coal in his hand, which he took with tongs from the altar. He touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your lawlessness is taken away and your sin is cleansed. That's what we do here on Sundays at the end. Where the priest, only he, that things that he can touch, gives us a medicine, the actual flesh of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And this is what the prophet Isaiah is talking about here. So our liturgical worship is not just biblical, but it's heaven on earth. It's heaven on earth. When we walk through those doors, we're no longer at St. Paul Church. We're in heaven. In the midst of the angels, Praising and worshiping God because he is the recipient of the liturgical worship. Abba Moses the Black, this is what he says about the divine liturgy. He said, the divine liturgy is the heartbeat of the church where heaven and earth unite and worship. In it, we offer ourselves as living sacrifices to God. Joining our voices with the angelic host of ceaseless praise and thanksgiving. That's why we do liturgy. That's why liturgy is so important to our church. Before St. Paul, the YLTC, that group, all we did was teaching. We have our Bible study. But 
we knew it had to be more. Bible study is great, but the fulfillment of the church happens during liturgical worship, which is the liturgy of the Eucharist. So our first lesson is liturgical prayer is what? Biblical worship. Second lesson, liturgical worship is what? I can't hear you guys. Heavenly worship. Finally, the last one. Attending liturgy is not the goal. The goal is communion with God. Liturgy is good to come to, but that's not the goal. Our goal isn't just to attend, but it's to participate. It's, if you guys notice, during liturgy, there is a part for a priest. There is a part for the assistant priest. There is a part for the deacon. There is a part for the assistant deacon. And then there is also a part for the people. We have a part. When we stand, it's not about whether my voice sounds good or not. Who cares? We're worshiping God. So we must participate. And the way we do that is through communion. That's the goal. When I started getting into the church, there was a, you know, again, language is a barrier. We didn't have this English liturgy. So I used to go to an Coptic church. And I went to the Coptic church. And it was nice. It was good. You know, it was first experience. First time there. And it came time for communion. And I've never been there. This is my first time. It was back in 2013 or 14. When the communion line started, people didn't come and, like, line up, the people that wanted to take Holy Communion. What they do is they go row by row. Like, the whole row goes and partakes in Holy Communion. And I see everybody going. Like, you know, the you know, rows in front of me, go, keep, they keep going, they keep going. And it's getting to my row. And now it's like, what do I do? I'm not used to this. You know, grew up in a church where you kind of take Holy Communion for until you hit a certain age. And after that, people tell you, don't. Don't take Holy Communion. So with that mindset, I stayed back. I didn't know what to do. So I was like, okay, you know, this is what I've been engraved. I stayed back. At the end of the service, I guess somebody noticed it. And they came and they talked to me, very nice uh, gentleman. And he said, are you baptized? I was like, yeah, I'm baptized, and I'll talk about the oxygen. And then he, it was, he, it was baffled, like, why didn't you take Holy Communion? Like, he didn't say those words, but he was like, if you're baptized, like, why are you not taking Holy Communion? In our church, we have the biggest misconception. I grew up with that. It took me a while to kind of get over that. But the more we learn that we will see why we come in liturgy, it's not just to say, I went to liturgy. We come to liturgy to partake in the flesh and blood of our Lord and our Savior. That's why we come to liturgy. Imagine I invite you to a dinner. And you come to my house, and dinner is served, and you say, ah, I'm good. How do you think I would feel? This liturgy is a feast. And Christ is offering himself. The goal isn't to attend liturgy. It's communion with God. So what St. Paul, what he's talking about, the knowledge of God, that intimate relationship happens as a result of liturgical worship. So where did this Holy Communion come from? So we're going to talk about Holy Communion. Let's talk a little bit about where, what it is. And Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26. This is on Holy Thursday. So the last week of this Lent is called Holy Week. And then on Thursday, that's when Christ institutes Holy Communion. And this is what he said. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. This is why we do liturgy. Liturgy happens for communion. You can't have communion without liturgy. 
Liturgy doesn't happen unless there's communion. And this is what the priest says right before Holy Communion. This is the prayer that he tells us. And we said we believe that this is truly you. Again, no greater knowledge of God than being in communion, being one with God. When I think of that knowing God, there is a story in the Gospel of Luke towards chapter 24 or 25. And it's about two people, and they're walking. And this is right after the crucifixion. So Jesus Christ was crucified, and he was buried. And there's two people walking on the road to Emmaus. And they're upset. They had given their life for this Savior, or they thought it was their Savior. But then they saw him being crucified, being nailed on the cross, and he didn't do anything. He looked defeated. And they were walking on the road. They were very upset. And here comes Christ. And he's walking with them next to them, and they had no idea it was him. And he's like, what are you guys upset about? And they get mad. He said, don't you know? Are you the only person on here that hasn't heard? The Savior, the person we thought it was the Savior, he was crucified. He died. Then he was buried. And we went to the tomb, and we couldn't find his body. And they're saying all these things to Christ, walking with them. They're upset. And Jesus starts talking to them. He's like, don't you know what the prophet said? Like all these must happen? And that he would resurrect and that he would live? And he's given them the greatest Bible study. Still, they don't know it's him. They're walking. And he finally said, the night comes. And they said, let's go to the house. And we pick up the story here. And verse 29, and he went in to stay with them, talking about Christ. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were open, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. All this time that they were walking with him, they did not know him, until he blessed the bread, broke it, and gave it to them. And that's what happens here every Sunday. The blessing of the bread, the prayer that transfigures into the actual flesh and blood of our Lord and our Savior. If you want to know Christ, if you want to have a relationship with Christ, no greater way, no other way than Holy Communion. Sometimes I feel like That's our life. Those two people, we like Christ next to us. We like to know about him. When he was walking with them, he talked about the prophecies. He talked about what happened in the Old Testament, all the things that had to be said. Look, like Dagwan, we're having a life group. That's great. Bible study, that's great. Fellowship, that's great. But that's not the goal. That's not the goal. The goal is communion. All of the things that we do is a means to get us to partake in communion. I'm not against the fellowship. I'm not against the Bible study, the life group. I love it. That's how we all, most of us started. But the goal, the ultimate goal, For us to know God, the same way the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, they went a long day. It wasn't until nighttime that they knew him. Sometimes we're just like them. Christ, what he's saying is, and the old prophet, you think about it, Moses. Only a certain people could get closer to uh, to God. Christ is saying, that's not enough, so I'm going to come. And he came, and he ate with people. He healed people. He performed all miracles. 
That was Christ next to us. But Christ said, there is more. I'm going to die. And the goal is me and you. That you eat my flesh. That you drink my blood. That's what his goal. There is a beautiful verse in the book of Colossians, chapter 1, verse 26 to 27, that wraps, kind of ties everything together. St. Paul tells us, the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saint. What mystery? To them, God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of the mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ and you, the hope of glory. What St. Paul is telling us, that's the goal. Christ in you. The mysteries that have been revealed in the Old Testament, everything that people have been trying, now has been revealed to us through our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. That is why he came. He didn't come just to teach us. He didn't come just to baptize us. He came to give us his flesh, to give us his blood for the remission of our sins. Sometimes I think about the fall of man. In the book of Genesis, the fall of man was a a result of God saying, don't eat this forbidden fruit. So we ate. But for that healing, for us to receive remission of sins, he said, eat my flesh and drink my blood. And what do we do? Sometimes I figure, I think, why? Why does our brain work that way? He told us, don't eat. We ate. He said, eat this if you must eat. And we say, "Uh, I don't know. So I'll wrap up with this. I know most of you, maybe this is new to you. A lot of people, like liturgical worship is new. Talk about Eucharist is new. We might not understand much. And that's okay. When it comes to liturgical worship, though, Jesus has been saying to us over and over to come a little bit earlier. We start at 7. Just so that, like, people could make it on time. Maybe seven is too early. But I, my challenge, when it comes to liturgical worship, come a little bit earlier. Maybe you typically get here about 8.30. Could you get here at 8.15, 8 o'clock? And just challenge yourself. Because liturgical worship is biblical worship. God as the recipient. So it's not based on what works for my schedule. And liturgical worship is heavenly worship. We're not going to just the church. We're going to heaven. And we're worshiping the almighty God. And he's the recipient of that worship. And in return, he gives us his flesh. He gives us his blood for the remission of our sins. This week is about the paralyzed man. He was paralyzed for 38 years. 38 years. When Christ saw him, he said, do you want to be made well? Do you want healing? Some of us, maybe it's been 38 years since we've partaken in Holy Communion. Maybe it's been that long that we've come to liturgy. God is asking us this week, do you want to be made well? Do you want healing? There is no challenge this week, but it's all about an invitation. It's an invitation to have eternal life with God. It's an invitation to be in communion with God, because that's what liturgical worship is. 
The goal isn't attendance. The goal isn't just to come to church. But the goal of liturgical worship is to have communion with God. Glory be to God.